Welcome to Talent Hub Talk. I am Ben Duncan, and this is a place where prominent and inspirational figures from both the local ANZ and global Salesforce Ohana share their stories. In today's episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Joey Chan, Salesforce MVP and the founder of Cloud Jedi. Joey shares what first interested him in a career in IT, how he got started in the Salesforce ecosystem, and what encouraged him to start his own business only one year into his full-time working life. We discussed the Salesforce ecosystem in the Philippines, how Joey differentiates his business from others, and what he looks for in new team members to ensure that Cloud Jedi are quality-focused and keep customers coming back for more. Joey is passionate about continually upskilling and delivering value to clients on both the Salesforce and MuleSoft platforms. So we discuss why more Salesforce developers aren't learning MuleSoft, And Joey shares some insight on the new hyper-automation certification that is coming to market and who it is suitable for. I hope you enjoy the episode. Joey, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. No, my pleasure. My pleasure. So you're, you're well known in the ecosystem. A lot of people will, um, will know who you are and, and because of the great work you do and, and the amount that you, uh, you give back to the, the community. But what I would like to do is start a bit before your, your entry into the world of Salesforce and, um, and understand, I guess, what has brought you to this point. So what was it about IT that first interested you and, and made you want to pursue a career in this space? So uh, for me, it actually uh, started way back in ch- my childhood. So basically, I got exposed to computers way, way back. So um, in a way, that got me interested. Well, partly because of the screens, probably. But at the same time, I think there's a lot of interest, mainly because there's so much you can do with one device. And uh, in a way, um, when the dial-up connection, the internet came in, that opened up the horizons right in a way um you used to need to go through encyclopedias to search for uh, answers my mother used to told to uh, to tell me basically whenever i have a question look up look it up right but uh, most likely i wouldn't mainly because <laughs> I, it's going to take so much time for me to search for that which part of the book it is right so and i'm still not sure if it's even there so it's, it's quite interesting how the dial-up connection and the internet brought all of these up. And going through the high school years, basically, I really enjoyed computer gaming a lot. And part of it is I really wanted to work with technology. And then that actually brought me to IT. So luckily, uh, I uh, got into university and I actually took up um, BSIT. So that's where I got started. So did you, did you always see yourself as, um, as like a, a techie? Like, would you, um, when you were growing up, were you always able to kind of pick up any technology quickly? And, um, uh, were you one of these people that would, would also like break hardware and try and put it back together? I'd say yes. Um, uh, although I try to stay away from the hardware part, mainly because, uh, there's going to be a big cost, especially, uh, coming from the Philippines. Um, it's, actually quite expensive uh, relative to the income of, uh, of a typical person here, right? So in that sense, I mostly tinker with the software part. So um, I remember way back, um, even before uh, we have iMessage where we can actually send text messages using computers, I actually um, got one of those Bluetooth devices and got an app to allow me to send text messages remotely. So it's a lot easier to type from the computer compared to um, send text, text messages on the phone itself, right? So I used to do that a lot. And how do you sync things? So it's one of those things that got me really interested. Yeah, nice. So h- how did you then um, come across Salesforce? What was the the first exposure of Salesforce to you? And at that point, what was the market like in the Philippines? That was their big demand when you first came across Salesforce? So this was actually way back in 2008. Uh, I was still in college, probably, I think, um, third or fourth year in college. So a company based in, here in the Philippines was doing uh, Salesforce consulting. So if I remember correctly, there's probably just two companies here in the Philippines that's doing Salesforce consulting. And uh, this was one of them. Back then, they were really small, um, probably less than 20 people in terms of size. So in a way, they... What they did is they actually taught Salesforce administrator in our university. And that gave me a chance to actually see uh, the capabilities in terms of the Salesforce um, platform. That was, uh, if I remember correctly, um, Visual Force was only 
newly introduced that time. So it's fairly new. Um, companies were still either using Visual Force or um, Adobe Flex to build user interfaces on Salesforce. So it's one of those things that got me interested mainly because of what I can do and how fast I can build things, right? Compared to the traditional model of um, using PHP, my SQL, and um, building all of those from scratch, right? So, yeah, nice. So, and and um, at the, the the point, did you see like there was going to be an obvious career path? Um, <clears throat> like, did you see that the market was starting to build, and those two consulting firms were going to, you know, expand into to new new companies, new options from a career perspective in the Philippines? Right. Uh, to be quite honest, uh, my main distinction back then, uh, when I graduated uh, back in 2009, is I had two main big options. So should I go with Salesforce or should I go with SAP? Um, I actually had a dream back then. I wanted actually want to have my own business within five years. So considering that, would I be able to build a business on SAP within five years? Highly unlikely. But with Salesforce, there's so much I can do on my own without necessarily having a large team. And in a way, that actually gave me so much more opportunities because um, starting from a freelance point of view, um, that's one of the biggest ways it's actually easy to um, get started, mainly because all of the learning materials are quite open. Unlike SAP, where then you actually have to be like a customer or part of a partner in order to get the learning resources, right? So that actually paved way in terms of um, there's nothing really stopping you if you really wanted to learn the platform, right? And more so, um, on top of that, the community. So in terms of the opportunities back then, I would say it's sort of a gamble, mainly because there's only one of two options. But at the same time, um, looking back now, it's well worth it, right? A hundred percent. So what was it about running and, and having your own business that always appealed to you? Uh, I'd say um, Philippines, in terms of employment scene, isn't necessarily a great place to 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 work. In in a sense that uh, most of the companies that are um, are situated here are mainly in the business districts, and most of the time, the travel time that you have to go through is, in my case, at least two hours a day. Sorry, two hours per way. So it's actually a total of four hours per day. So. In a sense, those four hours hours are actually very valuable in terms of getting things done. And also, not just that, it's really the energy that you, you drain, right, during the commute itself. Imagine going through uh, different modes of transportation, going through bus, trains, and and in comparison with, um, let's say, those in Australia or um, other countries, more developed countries, it's not as good too, though. So considering all of those, how tight it is and things like that, so... No one wants to spend four hours commuting every day. Exactly. So, so, um, so then I guess Cloud Jedi was born, but you mentioned freelancing. So did you initially start the business as, as a freelancer, like uh, running it, doing additional kind of hours, picking up little projects here and there? Yep. Basically, I, I, that's actually where I started. So um, in a way, um, that opened up the opportunities in terms of the client base that we have now, mainly because we started as a freelancer. And uh, in a way, we have small projects, few hours here and there. And then from there, that then grew in terms of, hey, um, if you're someone, you're the type of person that does great work and you're quite fast in terms of what you do with this, with the proper quality in place, it's just a matter of time when somebody would need something uh, within the Salesforce platform because it's growing too, right? And part of what I did too during the start of my career and Till now, it's every now and then I would actually um, answer questions on the um, uh, Salesforce community. So it's now also called Salesforce community now, but then uh, it used to be um, called the answers community. So basically, that's where uh, people ask questions about Salesforce. I actually use that as both as a learning mechanism and also to be able to understand what um, kind of problems companies are facing. Right. So. In a way, if I don't know the answer, I would research it and answer it there and also help somebody else at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good branding, right? I guess people see you answering the questions and then when you're running a freelance business as well, there's the opportunity to solve the problem that you've helped them with as well. Um, So obviously the market in the Philippines has grown since there were Mm -hmm. two companies there. There's obviously a lot more now. Um, Since since building out your business, um, Cloud Jedi, how have you 
How have you differentiated yourself from the competition? And, and I guess, why do companies use you? Why do they keep coming back? In terms of differentiation, I think um, we're actually intentionally small in terms of a company size. So um, we're actually less than 10. And But at the same time, uh, we try to focus as much as possible on the quality work. And the thing is, um, if you typically think about outsourcing or if you think about destinations like uh, uh, Philippines and India, usually cost is the main driver for that, right? But then uh, my question there is, um, if you're looking for some of the best talent, cost should not be your primary uh, factor, right? So in a way, that's actually where we're differentiating ourselves is if you're looking for some of the best quality work and somebody that actually knows uh, all of the different parts of the ecosystem, and if th there's going to be something that we won't know, right? But at the same time, we'll know who to ask to, right? So. Yeah, it's interesting. So you you are positioning yourself as like the premium option in the market, right? You're not the cheapest, but you you're saying that what we deliver is the best work. So that that's mm -hmm. obviously as you grow the business, and obviously you go from one to two to three to to now a company of around ten people. It, I guess it gets harder to maintain that quality because you're you're not necessarily doing all the work yourself as you grow and expand. So how how have you approached building your team and making sure that you are keeping that quality at, at the right. kind of the, the center of the business? Yep. I'd say uh, uh, one of the things that would definitely change is the speed because I used to be able to answer within five minutes sometimes, actually, uh, of, let's say, an email, because mainly because we were the ones building it, right? So part of the process is setting proper expectations that, hey, since these are changing, we have a team now. I'm not necessarily directly involved on all of the projects, on some of the projects. And uh, part of it is just setting proper expectation. Okay, we'll make sure that we uh, respond within this time. And if ever I'm needed, I'm always there to be able to um, to support projects, right? So it's one of those things that we have to cover. Uh, regarding quality, that's always going to be a concern in terms of a growing team. But at the same time, uh, one of the biggest things that you just have to do is having the proper um, systems in place in terms of basically a checklist of things to, to do, right? The ones that I used to do in my mind, I simply have to literally write it down. Here are things that you have to check and make sure to, to go through these each time we need it, right? And soon enough, uh, they'll just adopt it. And in a way, um, it's going to be a process. It's not going to be something quick. There will be mistakes. Uh, we expect that. But at the same time, it's the process of actually getting them to a certain level or a certain standard that, that matters. Mm -hmm. So what do you look for when you're hiring then if you're looking to bring someone into the team? Are there are you looking for Salesforce developers with experience or or is that not as important as like the the mindset and the the standards and, and values and things like that for you? Yep. I'd say um I'm mostly looking into the mindset in terms of how much are you actually willing to learn? How in a way hungry are you in terms of uh, that learning process because there are already quite a lot of really good developers, whether they're Salesforce or other technologies, right? But my question is, are you the type of person that's constantly learning? Are you the type of person that would be willing to learn, let's say, outside of your working hours? Are you the type of person that actually enjoys looking at, let's say, other people's code in order for you to learn how others do it and at the same time, um, see what you can adopt, right? So at least for me, um, one way I try to look at uh, candidates is um, what is contributions? Because I'm, of course, uh, biased regarding uh, what I did before. So it's actually contributions to the community. Are you the type of person that would actually spend time helping others out without necessarily gaining something from it? Are you the type of person what, that would do this if even if you're not getting paid for it? Because those are, in a way, signs for me to see how passionate this person is in terms of technology. Because those are things that cannot be replaced, right? Because at the end of the day, um, the, the talent or th that you have or people that are really good at development may have that. But if they're not willing to learn, keep on learning and, and improving their craft, that's going to be a problem, right? So I look more for the attitude. Are you the type of person that ideally aiming to be one of the best or are you there just for a job in a way that, hey, 
you just want to have a good paying job. That's it, right? Or mm-hmm. are you the type of person that want to keep improving and learning from uh, some of the best people within the ecosystem, right? So interesting enough, uh, one thing that we did for our team is, okay, we tried to gather who are all of the MVPs, right? I, we gathered the list of all of the MVPs. Okay, rather than focusing your time on social media like Facebook or other uh, social media platforms, why don't you start using LinkedIn, following all of these MVPs, and then eventually you'll see a lot of posts that are going to be quite interesting. And in a way, that's a really fa- good way in terms of focusing on learning, right? Yeah, I guess all the MVPs, are, or most of them are still putting out content and um, and uh, yeah, giving back to the community. So I guess there's a lot that can be taken from them and learned. Um, it, it's interesting because you, uh, over the last couple of uh, weeks or months, I, I've been looking into you know, more of the kind of cross-skilled developer in that they would know Salesforce and MuleSoft. I had mm-hmm. um, a requirement in, in Sydney where I was looking for someone that could work on both platforms. And I found that there were very few people out there that, that have done both. And I guess, you know, the ones that I have found that have, have done both are those kind of people that you just mentioned that want to like learn and, you know, never, never, um, I guess hit, hit a plateau. They, they want to keep pushing and, and MuleSoft came along and it was, it was a, a good platform for people to learn. And I know that you're, um, you're an advocate of that. You're across both platforms and also you're growing you're growing um, your team into to both areas. So why why do you find that it is quite unique that people haven't, you know, worked across MuleSoft and, and taken the opportunity to learn MuleSoft? Um, and, and why was it important for you and your team to do that? Yep. Um, regarding that, I think uh, a lot of it depends on the type of person you are. Uh, the thing is about Salesforce, there's already so much to learn. You could simply stay on the Salesforce ecosystem I mean, you already have the the sales cloud, uh, service cloud, and all of the industry verticals. I mean, that alone is a full time job in itself. And depending on the type of companies that you're um, working in, whether it's consulting or um, or in house, um, there's already so much you can learn. There's so much work, and adding another technology that's, I would say, something a lot different is something that most people don't necessarily have in terms of time to learn. But at the same time, uh, these things are, for example, MuleSoft is something that's meant for the larger enterprises, right? So it's really medium to large. If you think about it, um, there's quite a lot of uh, smaller businesses, right? That won't necessarily be able to to use MuleSoft, uh, mainly because it doesn't make sense for their business or organization. But at the same time, there's a certain level. And at the same time, most of the time, it really depends on which part of the mules of uh, implementation that they need. Is it their own company that's actually buying it? Or are they actually trying to work for, let's say, a, um, an SI that needs to develop on mules of, right? So a lot of it, in a way, if you think about it, it's going to be uh, a bit harder to move to another totally different technology unless your company adopted it. Okay, we bought MuleSoft. And we need someone to take care of it and be able to build on top of it, right? Um, I think that's uh, one of the biggest challenges why most people are not necessarily moving towards uh, or learning the MuleSoft, mainly because is there an, um, a need for within our organization? Because uh, for the most part, uh, let's say for SIs, they're actually developing MuleSoft developers, meaning from scratch, whether from whatever technologies they are, they're actually building those apps. So, it's highly specialized because Microsoft in itself already has quite a lot of um, specialized knowledge that you need. And really, I would say a lot more technical too, though, in terms of um, learning the platform, especially if you're uh, not just focusing on the cloud-based offering, if you're also focusing on uh, on on-premise, using Docker, Kubernetes. So there's so much to learn there. And networking, also another skill to learn, right? So for the most part, Salesforce developers don't actually need to worry about all of those things. Yeah, that makes sense. I think, um, yeah, it will be interesting to see how that changes over the years, like to see if more people do show an interest in, in, um, in, in picking up both. And, um, and I know there's some, some, obviously there's some, some developments in the MuleSoft space. I know there's some more, um, products and, um, uh, and, and uh, capabilities that are coming through. Um, can you, t- what, I know there's a new, I believe there's a new certification around, um, hyper automation. 
Correct. Yes. So basically, uh, this is a new certification. Um, take note, I believe it hasn't been officially launched yet. But uh, basically, this is something interesting. It's a MuleSoft certification. So what it covers is, um, in a way, both Salesforce and uh, MuleSoft to be able to create automation across multiple different systems. So interesting enough, um, it actually covers the uh, AnyPoint platform. So that's a MuleSoft. It also covers uh, MuleSoft RPA. So meaning it stands for Robotic Process Automation. These are the automation uh, where there's no API involved, meaning you're actually using screens, having a bot try to click on buttons and enter your data into input fields. And then there's also the Composer, which is the no-code platform for integration. Uh, if some of you are familiar with Zapier, uh, you could think about it somewhat like that. So basically, um, configuration. It also, all, can also be similar to flows, actually. So basically, you tell it, hey, I want to get all of the records from this other system, not just Salesforce. And then from there, get the data. What do you then want to do with it? Do you want to send a message to, to Slack? Do you want to send a text message using Twilio? All of those things are, um, in a way, there, declaratively, actually within Salesforce. And then there's also, um, it also covers the flows, Salesforce flows, and orchestrator, and Einstein chatbots. So in a way, it covers uh, the different domains in terms of automation. And in a way, actually understanding how these are meant to work together and make sure that you have all of these capabilities and how do you leverage the complete automation rather than just limiting yourself with uh, connecting with uh, with systems that have an API. It sounds um, complex, but also like who who is going? Who's it going to be for? Because do you need to know MuleSoft more so than Salesforce, or do you need to know Salesforce more so than MuleSoft? Like, is it doesn't seem to me like there's going to be many people that are going to now this certification. Uh, I'd say it's um, from my point of view, it can be both, but from my perspective, in a way. Because coming from this uh, really long Salesforce background, uh, there's also an advantage in terms of actually learning Salesforce a lot and then going into that certification, mainly because um, you already know all of the different capabilities of um, what you can do with the orchestrator, with the flows, and all of these things. Because uh, in a way, Composer is another tool. It depends on the background. If you've done uh, integrations, that's going to be super helpful, mainly because you know how these interactions are going to be happening, right? How do these HTTP requests uh, get sent over and what's the response? And dealing with uh, JSON, JSON, the, it's a f file format. And all of those things, those skills would actually be beneficial in terms of leveraging this. And for the most part, um, the AnyPoint platform part is actually just under making sure that you understand how it's meant to uh, work together. Take note, this certification is... Um, it's not necessarily going really deep into the AnyPoint platform. It's more of understanding how these are meant to be to work together. You could think about it more like an architect and just to make sure that you actually know these different capabilities, right? In terms of the design and so solution. For the most part, mm -hmm. uh, you usually have a MuleSoft developer building the integrations on the AnyPoint platform. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned Zapier and um, and how Composer is similar. Um, because I, I use Zapier and I know a lot of people use it because it's a, a great price point, right? It's um, it's super easy to use, but also it's it's relatively cheap for for the power it provides. So is that the the when you say MuleSoft isn't for everyone, it's kind of from medium and and larger. Is that the the thing that's restrictive at the moment? Is the price point for these companies? Um, it could be yes. That's one big thing that I hear a lot. Although at the same time, uh, we have to consider you also get the AnyPoint platform. Based on my um, my other customers or clients, um, basically the price point that you get for MuleSoft usually starts at $100,000 a year. But then that's US dollar. And then um, depending on the regions, of course, there are discounts and all. But let's say for the new automation package, it actually starts at $50,000. So in a way, the entry point is actually a lot lower. If you're simply looking for the composer itself, um, that probably won't necessarily be the best tool for the job. The main point of um, 
all of these packages is actually how it's meant to work together. There are definitely a lot cheaper options if you're thinking about um, the other options in terms of um, if you're let's say uh, uh, let's say a nonprofit looking for options. Um, there's definitely going to be a lot cheaper options for for that. But if you're thinking about um, the value of all of these different uh, products that's going to be working together, that's actually where it shines. So if, as we mentioned, um, there are, it's not just Zapier, there are also other um, uh, integration tools that I've used, like for example, uh, make.com. So it's formerly Integromat. So that's one of those um, um, low-code integration tools. At the same time, um, the main power is actually how you connect it to RPA and also the endpoint platform. And soon enough, later on, actually, um, something that I believe they're working on is how do you then connect Salesforce flows and create all of those integration at the same time? That's actually when it actually shines in terms of capabilities and being able to see mm -hmm. all of the different APIs that you can connect to within Salesforce flows. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, if that's coming in the future, I guess that's that's mm -hmm. going to be a game changer for for people. Um, so, um, what obviously you're passionate about Salesforce and MuleSoft, but if if we um, areas that we haven't discussed today, like are there new um, areas of Salesforce that have your particular focus and and areas that you think people should be investing time in learning right now? I'd say it really depends on the goal. Uh, one thing that I I'm definitely a lot more advocate of is actually how you build up your consulting skills in terms of soft skills, right? Uh, the thing is, these skills aren't necessarily something that you can learn from, from Trailhead. But at the same time, the question is, how do you then build this up, right? Do you do it uh, on your own? Do you figure this out on your own? So uh, these things, uh, I would say, there are, of course, uh, paid and free options, right? At the same time, it really depends on what you what type of job you're looking for. If you're looking for, let's say, a developer job, um, one of the best ways you, you develop it is really going through code. Uh, GitHub is actually a really great place to actually see. What are some of the top products on the Salesforce that use Apex? And just try to reverse engineer. How did they build this? And why did, it, did they build it this way? What I would do even is I would look for who actually built this. And I would get a list sometimes hey, these are some of the things that I noticed. Um, I would then try to research it. If I can't find the answer, I'm wondering why you did it this way rather than this. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things that I would actually ask the author themselves. In a way, uh, I found what I found is these are actually engaging discussions because, of course, um, they also care about their craft, right? In a way, there's somebody interested enough to be able to discuss these and um, send them a message. So. I find this really valuable in terms of uh, connecting with the community and also getting to know how they think, right? So, yeah, that's awesome. I think um, you know if, if you've put some work out there and someone starts asking you some questions on it, you're going to reply and you, you you will welcome that kind of conversation. So it's definitely a way to spark up a conversation and then build rapport and, and learn and, and give back as well and you know share ideas. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then if you're <clears throat> on top of that, if you've learned enough. One way you could also contribute is you'll notice things like whether it's a bug or it's a new features that you think would be valuable, whether it's um, requesting for a new feature or even building them out yourself, um, sharing them, right? So there are so many opportunities for you to give value and at the same time to also stand out, right? Because one of the things that I actually built back then, um, probably um, 2013, 2014, it's actually a really simple app so way back in before the lightning experience, we have the classic, right? And then one of the annoying things if you're dealing with um, attachments is that if you need to upload 20 attachments, what you have is a dialogue, uh, choose file, attach. You have to do that 20 times. I actually built a really simple app. All you have to do is drag and drop that. Let's say if you have a 100 files that you want to upload to a single record, you could just drag and drop it and then it will just do all of the progress bars using the API. So it's those small things that actually make a dent in terms of user experience. Imagine if you're the person that's doing that uploading and hey, 
you have this 50, 100 files. And <laughs> in a way, that's not necessarily a great use of the time, right? Yeah, hundred percent. So yeah, and did you make that readily available? That was like a, yep. a free app. Uh, yes, yes, use? It, it is. It's on the app change. Although it, it's not relevant anymore, but at the same time, yeah. that actually um, gained quite a number of installs, mainly because there's quite a lot of value, and it's something that I only probably did it within one or two days. So if you're serious about those, I mean, there's so many things, small things that you can start and adding value, and at the same time. You also learn about that app exchange review process during that process, right? So understanding what are the things to watch out for in terms of what they check. And so there, it's actually a le- really good learning process. I'd encourage developers to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, awesome. And it's something to talk about, right? It's, um, you know, if ever you're, you're, you're going into an interview or, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to share that. And, um, and that's a way of building your brand as well by putting information like that online and, <clears throat> and getting a following. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, it's really focusing on the value that you can contribute. Um, we keep hearing a lot. We have to stand out, right? But in what way? I mean, there's also what you call bad publicity, right? But at the same time, we want to be able to be seen as the type of person that brings a lot of value. And if you can demonstrate that, hey, these are type, this is the, a glimpse of what you can do. In a way, the employees would want to hear more and definitely would want to work with you, right? Definitely, yeah. So you you gave some insight into what the uh, Philippine um, Filipino Salesforce market was like when you got started. Mm-hmm. What's it like today? I'd say it's so much different in terms of um, opportunities and in terms of salaries and all. Seems like it's probably like multiple times better now. And one big thing is actually how many companies now are actually adopting remote work. So you're able to actually work from home. It's actually one because back in 2010, that was sort of unheard of. Here in the Philippines, you really have to report to the office daily and you have to clock in at a certain time and certain time. So that's one of the things that I didn't enjoy is uh, I'm the type of person that uh, tries to be a, a high achiever. So I try to complete things as fast as I can with the same quality, but at the same time, I didn't want to be the type of person that, hey, I I didn't want to pretend to be working. (laughs) I just need to (laughs) clock out at a certain time, right? So it's those things that um, I didn't necessarily enjoy back then. But at the same time, um, that's that's basically the culture, right? So whether you go with it or uh, you get out of it, right? So um, that's why that's also one of my motivation to go on my own in a way. I'd rather be the type of person that would sprint towards something, meaning I learned all of the, I went through all of the blogs that I can find, learn everything that I can through documentation in the community. And I didn't want to be limited in a way by the typical progression of a career path in a, in a corporate environment when you spend uh, one, two years in a junior position, another one, two, three years in a mid level, and then another few years to get to the senior, right? So, yeah, I think it's more of uh, dreaming bigger. And take note, this is also a privilege for me, all right? So being able to, in a way, take that risk as early as possible in my career. I basically went on my own less than one year out of college, right? So at the same time, there's also the safety net. For example, hey, I, my parents would still feed me if, <laughs> if uh, things wouldn't go well, right? So... It's those things. Take note that's also a privilege uh, that, for example, many of our Western friends wouldn't necessarily have, right? It's really a uh, the cult- a cultural thing. So that's something that we recognize a lot in terms of privilege. Yeah, I think like that that entrepreneurial leap for everyone has to come at the right time if they're going to do it. And obviously, there's different stages of life. Um, you know, one year out of college, a lot of people would have seen as a risk because you don't have a huge amount of experience, but then actually, you know, you probably don't have the same overheads and, and the family and, and things like that that you might have later in life. So actually, it, it could be a great time to do it for people. Right. I think uh, one of the things that most people think about entrepreneurial is uh, you need that much experience. Uh, I'd say you don't necessarily need to. Uh, 
it really depends on what type of work that you need. The thing is, um, there are definitely pros and cons with that. I'm not saying that experience is not necessarily uh, that important, but at the same time, mo- in many cases, it's sort of a fear. I are always going to say year by year, I don't have that much experience yet. And then later on, you'd have a family, you have a house, a mortgage, all of those cars, and no, I can't do it anymore. It's too late. You don't necessarily want to, to get to that point, right? It can also be an excuse, right? So at the same time, there's also that part about comfort zone. Okay, you've been used to this um, setup wherein you're getting a regular paycheck. Okay, next, how do you then level up, find another employer that would pay you more? Is that the thing? The thing about entrepreneurship is that um, uh, it's up to you how much work you want to to put into it. But the thing is, um, you also assume all of the risks, right? So, I mean, pandemic also affected quite a lot of people. Some businesses actually closed down. If At, at one point, they probably made a lot of money and they lost all of it, right? That's always a possibility. Mm-hmm. At the same time, it's also about prudent with what you're spending on. And there are things that you can control. There are things that you can. But at the same time, um, question is, what do you do with those that you can control? Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Well, Joy, thank you so much for for sharing your story and giving us an insight into how that journey has evolved. Um, If anyone does want to pick your brains, reach out, ask some questions, where's the best place to find you? Sure. It's actually going to be on LinkedIn. So I'm mostly there. So just search for me. I think it's probably Joey Chan or probably search for Salesforce and then Joey Chan, you'd probably see me. And then, yeah, feel free to reach out. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the chat. And if you did, please make sure you have subscribed for future episodes that are coming through. I would also be very grateful if you would consider leaving a review on your chosen podcast platform as five-star reviews will help us to reach more trailblazers from across the world. I look forward to sharing another episode with you soon. And thanks again.